Uh, okay, so hi, my name is Chris. Uh, I already mentioned I work as a production engineer at, uh, at Facebook London, working as a, uh, a member of Web Foundation. Um, I'm going to be giving a whistle-stop tour of the new version of control groups added in uh, Linux 4.5. Don't worry if you haven't the faintest clue what uh, control groups are yet. Um, I guess since we're in the containers dev room, probably some of you have at least some kind of idea. Um, but I'll go into kind of uh, what they are, where you may have used them, and a comparison of the old and the new uh, in the next few slides. So like I said in this talk, I'm going to be giving kind of an introduction to control groups. Um, I'm going to go over w what they are, where you may have used them, uh, where you might have encountered them before. Um, if you already know something called control groups, like you've, you've fished around previously or you've used them before, you almost certainly have been interacting with version 1 um, of control groups. Control groups has, has existed in the kernel since a long, long time ago, since around 2008. Um, and it's been kind of building our, our love of containers. It's one of, one of the building blocks of containers um, as we know them. So it's definitely got a whole bunch of good things in it. Um, it's also got like a whole bunch of uh, problems, usability, foibles, other kinds of things which are not so great. Um, so I want to go into like w uh, what those are and uh, when you might encounter them and, and how we've tried to improve that in Sigur v2. Sigur v1 is currently now kind of in mostly in maintenance mode, um, whereas Sigur v2 is, is more in, in active development. They share the same core. It's mostly the, the user-facing API, which is kind of different. Um, and yeah, I'm also going to go over kind of what's, what's still to be done um, and what's, what's already been done. The core of Cgroup B2 is already stable since kernel 4.5, um, but we have a whole bunch of work we want to be done. A lot of, a lot of the core work has been to enable future work, um, to, to enable new features in Cgroups, which we're already working on. So first, a little bit about me. Uh, I've been working at Facebook for about three years. Um, I, uh, like I said, I work in this team called Web Foundation. Technically, Web Foundation is the team responsible for the web servers at Facebook, um, but web servers are kind of not, not usually extremely complicated. Like, they're stateless, they serve you cat pictures, and that's about it. Um, it, so we actually ended up becoming kind of a team which deals with the general reliability at Facebook. Um, this means we get involved with uh, production incident discussions and all sorts of, we, we, we generally act as kind of the, the guardians of reliability at Facebook. Um, yeah, so uh, I, like I said, I work at Facebook London. We have, a, we have an office there. We also have an office in Dublin, in, in Europe, and, and in Tel Aviv. Um, yeah, and we have a whole bunch of different kinds of people in Web Foundation. We have people who are experts at, at Linux and parts of Linux stack, which is basically my expertise. Um, we also have people who are experts in our cache architecture, our RPC, um, and uh, say like uh, the web push and stuff like this. It's basically a cross-functional group of experts which all come together to, to deal with when shit really hits the fan. So that kind of brings up the question, why, why do we as a team like care about C groups? And why, do, why does Facebook as a company care about C groups? So, um, we have many, many hundreds of thousands of servers, um, and we have a bunch of services which run on these servers. Some of them co-located on the same servers, some of them spread throughout servers. Um, it's all kind of all over the place. So most kind of outages at Facebook uh, uh, are a few, there are a few kinds of outages, but like one very common one is uh, failure in multiple systems. And there are a few things you need to do to mitigate that. Uh, another one, of course, is uh, actively mapping out your dependencies and making sure you have an understanding of your dependencies. But another big one is making sure that when two services run on, on a single machine, you don't end up with uh, a situation where one service completely overrides the other and results in it becoming completely useless. Um, so that's one of my my main concerns about uh, Secret V2 and one of the reasons why I'm super interested in it. So uh, a typical use case for this is like uh, you, you say on a, on a normal web server, uh, we, have, we have three types of running processes. Same goes for most other kinds of web servers, uh, other kinds of servers as well. Um, so you have your core workload. Your core workload is the thing which if you were to describe to somebody else what your server was actually doing, you would say it does this thing. It serves web requests. It does load balancing. Um, but usually you don't end up uh, only with this on your server. Um, you usually end up with a whole bunch of other stuff, especially if your company has been around for a while or you have some ideas about how you should architect stuff. You end up with a whole bunch of non-core services, which can probably be used interchangeably with kind of system services. Uh, this might be uh, stuff which just comes with Linux, like uh, also the kernel workers, or uh, it could also be like, uh, say, Kerberos daemons, or it could be like stuff which is related to your business needs, say, metric collections so we can work out uh, what is going on with our server, like whether we're managing to serve users correctly. 
But it, it, it's really, really bad if then this metric collection decides it's going to take up all the available memory in your server and then you can't actually serve users. Sure, it can tell me it did that, but I don't give a fuck if it like completely fucked up the whole web server, right? Um, same goes for cron jobs and chef. I care about my server being up to date, but I would rather have some system which, uh, which actually acts in a reasonable manner if chef starts taking a bunch of memory. I would rather it got degraded service and still managed to run than it took all of the memory or took all of the CPU and then everything was fucked. Like, I I would much rather have that, that outcome. Um, then we kind of have this third class, like ad hoc queries and debugging. Um, these are typically things you don't know that you need um, and don't end up getting run on mo the majority of servers. These are like things which you end up realizing you need only when an incident is already happening. Um, and we kind of want people to be able to dynamically uh, be able to determine the importance of those things um, as the incident is going on, whether they want it to take precedence over the core workload of the machine or not. So C groups is a very uh, good use case. Uh, sorry, this is a very good use case for C groups. Um, uh, like I mentioned, if you had some interaction with C groups, you've almost certainly been interacting with version one. Version two has been in development for like uh, five years now. It only just got stable in the Linux kernel. Um, but even on recent kernels, uh, version one is typically what's mounted by default. And the reason for that is, as you'd imagine with a different version number, uh, the actual changes are backwards incompatible. Um, so I'm going to be going over kind of why we've made them backwards incompatible in a moment. Um, so the fact that we typically boot with your init system only mounting the version one hierarchy um, is is a testament to why I'm doing this talk. Like, I know we have a whole, whole uh, group full of container experts in this room, and I, this is also kind of a sell to you about why you should give a fuck about C group v2 and why you should take the time to care about it and invest in it in your products. Um, so yeah, so in the previous slide, we talked about multiple processes fitting into each of these C groups as well. Um, so a C group can be set as tightly or as flexibly as you like. It can be all of the processes which are related to one service, um, or it can be a single process. It can be however many processes you like from zero to however many you like. Um, and yeah, the idea here is we don't impose a, we don't impose a structure on you. The, uh, one of the guiding principles behind V2 has been we want you to be able to choose how to use it. We don't want to have a hierarchy which imposes how you should do things. And we want the easy way to be the correct way. So a C group is a control group. They're one and the same. Uh, there's, they're a system for resource management on Linux. Um, like I mentioned, a resource here means like CPU, I/O, memory, and management here can mean, for example, uh, accounting. Like we know how much memory some particular, some process in some particular C group are using. It can also be limiting. Like we hit a particular threshold and we we take some violent action to, to curb that. It, it can also in V2. There's also been uh, some work towards throttling, which I'll go in as well. Um, generally. Uh, um killing or whatever is quite violent, um, so we want to have some remediative actions instead of just uh, just straight up killing stuff. Um, yeah, so uh, the way that Cgroup v2, uh, Cgroup v2 and v1 work are essentially you have this hierarchy. It's sysfs Cgroup. Um, it's a bu just a bunch of files and directories. We don't have a system call interface. Um, there may well be one in future, but we don't currently have one. The reason the reason this is kind of a good thing is it's really easy from some user space application, even if it's not written in C or C++, and you don't have access to uh, C library functions or, or system calls easily. Um, you can easily go and find out the state of your system when it comes to Cgroup. Uh, you can just look at some file. Like I would hope that all of you are, are using uh, languages which can like open a file, make a directory, remove a directory. Like yeah, that's I, I would hope like whatever the new hip kids are using still supports those kind of things. Um, so yeah, so each resource interface is is provided by a controller. You'll probably hear me use the word controller. Uh, resource and domain kind of interchangeably. The idea is uh, you write files in like some particular that apply to some particular controller. This controller takes the values which you provided and it provides them to the kernel and the kernel makes some kind of decisions based on what, va what values you gave it. Um, so it's essentially the backing store for, for all of the stuff which you input to C groups. So as mentioned previously, like uh, Workload isolation is a really big use case for C groups. Um, so you might have many background jobs on a machine, but you don't want them to override the main workload. That's the case which we talked about first. Um, there are also some other kind of other cases, like um, say you have a, a tier which runs uh, which runs asynchronous jobs in the background. We have we have that at Facebook, um, and some jobs have higher priority than others. Priority is a very abstract concept, but priority usually has something to do with resources. It usually means either you expect it has more memory or or less CPU or something like this. Um, it's very much up to you, like what exactly that priority means. Um, you also have shared environments. Say you're a VPS provider or something like that, and you don't want. Uh, 
some particular user to be able to use that container and steal all the resources from all your other cu customers, which are now going to go and leave you a bad review. Um, so yeah, so it, there are kind of a lot of use cases for cgroups here. And you might ask, hey, my my favorite uh, my favorite application X, like it already does this. Why should I give a single shit about cgroups? Well. The answer is, uh, if you have been using uh, any kind of software in the last eight years, I would really pray that it does it through cgroups. It probably does it transparently to you, and you don't ever have to like talk to cgroups directly. Um, but the the backing for all of these is cgroups. Like that's how they do resource limiting. So let's go concretely over how this works in in version one. So uh, in v1, sysfs cgroup uh, contains the names of all the resources which which have a controller. Um, so this might be CPU, memory, PIDs, that kind of stuff. And inside these, uh, inside these resource directories, there's another set of directories which are the cgroups themselves. So these cgroups exist in the context of this resource, and you put processes into those cgroups. Uh, for example, we have the PIDs one at the bottom, so because this is to do with PID, uh, PID resources, uh, it contains files in those directories, and those files are related to how many PIDs you can have in a cgroup, for example. Um, and we also have the concept of like uh, uh, having its own hierarchy for resource distribution. So in cgroup, in cgroup v1, you have a resource, and then you have a cgroup hierarchy underneath each resource. So even if cgroup 3 here was called the same as cgroup 1, say they were both called foo, from the kernel's perspective, they have absolutely no relation to each other. This is kind of important, because if you look at how, for example, system D sets out cgroups typically, um, you often end up with quite similar looking hierarchies in different resources, and you might even be inclined to believe they have some relation to each other. Well, from system D's perspective, I'm sure they do, but from the kernel's perspective, they do not. And that results in a huge, whole slew of like subtle issues which cause problems at scale, which I'll go into in a moment. Um, Cgroups, uh, cgroups are nested inside each other in this example. So when a cgroup is nested inside another, typically what it means is it can control some limited amount uh, up to the maximal amount of its parent. So if you have if you have a memory cgroup, um, and then you have a child of a, a cgroup which is also that uh, which is also another cgroup, then you can limit uh, up to the maximum uh, of its parent. So. The resource that, that uh, controls these cgroups, or the cgroup hierarchy that they're in, determines what kind of files there are. I already mentioned that if you're in the memory hierarchy, you can only access files related to memory. Um, like, for example, that's this file memory.limited bytes. You can read the limited bytes from it, or you can write to it and set a separate uh, limited bytes. Um, and one PID isn't exactly one cgroup um, per resource in cgroup v1. Um, so PID2 here is, is explicitly assigned to uh, to resources uh, A and C in cgroup 1 and 5, respectively. But because we don't assign it to anything in resource B, um, it actually goes to this root cgroup. The root cgroup is kind of a special concept in, in, in cgroups. It's essentially unmanaged territory. Um, how exactly it's managed is up to the controller. Um, but the idea is you don't really have the opportunity to set really any limits in the root cgroup because it's just the, the starting point for resource distribution of this resource across your whole machine. Um, so yeah, you do get some kind of accounting, but in terms of limiting, it's basically useless. So here is a concrete look at how this looks in cgroup v1. So you have uh, sysfs cgroup, uh, and then you have the resources, which are like block I, memory, and PIDs. And then you have the cgroup names. And we have nested cgroups here, A inside BG for two resources, and B inside ad hoc for two resources. Um, so once again, just as a reiteration, because this is really important that you get this, from the kernel's perspective, naming has no meaning. Like, if it's in a different resource, even if it has the same name, it has no meaning. Um, and that has all sorts of weird implications. So here's how it looks in cgroup v2 by comparison. So in cgroup v2, we actually don't see the resources anymore. If you remember how it looked in version 1, uh, we have resources under sysfs cgroup. But now we actually have the cgroups themselves under sysfs cgroup. So how do these uh, cgroups understand which resources they are supposed to apply to if they're not inside a resource hierarchy? Well, the answer is kind of uh, cgroups are global now. Um, they're essentially a, a, global, uh, a global set of uh, cgroups, and you enable resources inside the cgroups. Um, this means that uh, we have one hierarchy to rule them all. Um, and the idea is like you write to a special file, you tell us what particular controllers you want to enable, and we enable them for your cgroup. We don't require you to create dis disparate hierarchies each time. You instead create one hierarchy and enable cgroup controllers at will. 
first. So this is how the previous example now looks in cgroup v2. Um, so in cgroup v2, like I mentioned, we now have the cgroups directly at the bottom, but you write to this special file cgroup.subtree control, and that enables the uh, in the ch in the children of that cgroup that those controllers are enabled. Um, essentially, if you were not to enable them there, but they were enabled the next level up, it means they would compete freely for those resources that you didn't enable. Um, so yeah, so here's the version one hierarchy again for comparison. Um, and as you can see here, we have uh, resources first. Um, and remember that in version one, uh, secrets with the same name, again, don't have any relation to each other. Um, in secret v2, uh, we have this unified hierarchy. Um, and you enable resources for a C groups children by writing plus memory, plus PIDs, plus CPU, plus IO, that kind of stuff, uh, to cgroup.subtree control. And when you do this, the files appear in that directory instantaneously. Oh, and another thing to mention is, in real life, you also need to enable uh, the memory, PIDs, and IO controllers at the top level for this to work. But for the sake of simplicity, I've, I've not added them here. So the fundamental differences are obviously the unified hierarchy. Uh, resources apply to C groups now instead of C groups applying to some uh, some distance across uh, the hierarchy for a resource. Um, this is very important for some kinds of common operations in Linux. Like for example, you have page cache writebacks, and page cache writebacks transcend one particular resource. They they happen across a whole bunch of different resources, and we need to be able to uh, we need to be able to consider these actions together in unity to be able to form form reasonable limiting or other actions. Um, we also have granularity at the thread group ID, not the thread ID level. Uh, this is a contentious point, but it's, it's kind of important. Um, in cgroup v1, you could essentially put different threads from the same process into separate cgroups. This has a whole bunch of weird implications. Like, for example, uh, people would put, uh, say, different threads from the same process into different memory cgroups. I don't know how the fuck that's supposed to work. Like, uh, you have like basically the entire shared memory between these two fucking cgroups. I, I don't know. People have done insane shit with cgroups. This is this is the main the main thing. Is like we want to guide towards a, a reasonable implementation because it's not that these people are, are stupid. That's not the problem. It's just that C groups in V1 were like quite overcomplicated, so it made people do some insane shit. Um, so now limiting uh, the paid level kind of gets us like a, a more reasonable approximation of what people generally want. Um, also, without extensive cooperation, even for resources where maybe it would, in theory, make sense to to have different uh, different threads from the same process in different resources, it often ends up being like. It, you, you have to have some way to communicate which thread from your process is doing what. And there's no standardized way to do that in Linux, right? Like, you can set the, the com of your thread to, like, some value and then and look at, like, the value somewhere. But it, it's not standardized, and it's, like, really, really fucking hard to reason about. Um, so, yeah, it usually doesn't act in any reasonable way. In general, like, there's been a focus on simplicity and clarity in, in V2 over, like, ultimate flexibility. V1 was invented at the kind of the dawn of containerization. People didn't know what they wanted. They just know that they wanted something, and they, they wanted it now. Uh, so V1 was kind of a solution to this problem, and V2 is kind of more like a, a, more, uh, a more developed approach to the problems we know we're having for sure now. So an another new feature in V2 is uh, the addition of this no internal process constraint. So this means that C groups with processes um, and controllers enabled uh, cannot create child C groups. Um, essentially, this means that, in, in simpler words, uh, these red C groups either have to have no processes or they have to have no controllers enabled in that part of the hierarchy. Um, this is for a few reasons. Um, <coughs> It's kind of hard to reason about how that should act. Usually, in in v1, this in v1 this was allowed, and the th problem is now you have two different types of objects kind of competing against each other. So, say you have processes in I, and then you have some child C groups uh, under underneath I here. Um, now you have processes which are in I competing against C groups which are its children, and it's difficult. You have to make some kind of you have to make some kind of judgment about how we will treat processes compared to C groups. Maybe we can consider each one its own C group. Maybe we can consider them like I prime, like a separate C group. But it's quite hard to reason about. And for most cases, the better solution is just create another C group. Um, so this is another guide towards like helping people create a sane hierarchy. And the root C group is a special case. Um, the, the controllers themselves have to decide how they're going to handle resources in the root. 
So clearly breaking the API is kind of a big deal. Like C group, the C group API is, is a pretty fucking big deal. Like the fact that we want to create V2 instead of, instead of just improving V1 obviously needs some good, some good reasoning there. Um, so V1 works okay for basic situations, but it gets kind of exponentially complicated um, when you're getting more and more complex. Um, as I mentioned in V1, design kind of often followed implementation. Um, and Trying to rework kernel APIs after the fact is really, really, really hard. Like, you can't change the kernel API, the, the fundamental nature of the kernel APIs, which people rely on day to day in production. That's just not something you can do. Um, even for stuff which was designed up front, like I mentioned, like, generally the use cases for containers and C groups were not really that well fleshed out yet. They originally started as, as like, only for CPU, and then it grew and grew and grew kind of naturally. Um, it, it was generally hard to, to gauge at the time how C groups would be used, so uh, now this is an opportunity to redesign them and work them how, how we actually think they should be. Um, so to fix these kind of fundamental issues, you need to have an API break, and that's why v, V2 was created. So I want to go over some of the, the actual practical improvements, because I've talked a lot about like the theoretical, how we've designed it, but I also want to go over why we've designed it in that way and what that actually means. So, um, OK. Pop quiz, when you write to a file in Linux, what happens? It's not a direct question, I swear. You get a file, okay, you get a file descriptor. Okay, that, 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 was, uh, that was possibly before what I wanted. Okay, so does it write directly to the disk? Okay, so where, where, where does your data go? I got about five different answers. I'm not sure what on earth they were. Uh, okay, so it goes, you write a dirty page into, into, the, into the page cache. You have like, some, some subset of dirty pages now, and your write syscall came back and it said everything's, everything's great. Um, and from your application's perspective now, you can go on pretending, yes, it was written to disk, uh, and my write syscall succeeded, so it must be written to disk, and you can have all this class of, of wonderful belief. Um, but ultimately, it's not been written to disk, right? It's, it's still sitting in memory somewhere, and if you shut down the machine right now, shit's going to go haywire. Um, so yeah, so there are multiple operations here to be considered. First, you have the, your write syscall, which then goes and writes it at dirty pages, returns to you, and then later some kernel worker like PD Flush comes and it says, okay, now is the time by some magical standards like the inode dirty ratio, uh, I've decided I'm going to flush out these to disk. In V1, we don't have any, account, we don't have any tracking of this. So if you, if you wrote dirty pages, um, we don't know where they came from afterwards when we flush them to disk. So that IO goes to the root C group and we can't account it to your process or your C group um, simply because it wasn't tracked. It, it wasn't tracked where this page comes from. In V2 it is tracked um, and we can actually count these towards your, your limits. And we can also make kind of uh, reasonable decisions about like, oh, you have IO contention and this is what I should do based on that or you have memory contention and this is what I should do based on that when you're trying to do a, a page cache write back. Um, V2 is also generally like kind of better integrated with subsystems. So most of the actions we could do based on thresholds in version one were, were kind of crude or, or in the case of the memory subsystem, like quite violent. Um, you set like a, a limit with memory.limit and bytes and what happens is you, you set your application has like a one minute spike in memory usage and then the oom killer goes along and it goes, oh, I'm gonna kill you. And that's like the standard method of dealing with things. Like, Usually, like, processes don't particularly like being kill nined. Uh, I, I don't know, like, may, maybe, like, there's some kind of sadistic processes which like that, but, uh, I mean, ultimately, it's not, not a, very, a very good way of, of limiting resource usage. What you really want to do is, like, tell it, okay, calm the fuck down and, like, stop allocating memory. Or in, in, the, better, in the better case where you can't tell it to calm the fuck down, you want to tell the operating system, hey, that guy's gone fucking nutso. Uh, I would like to now like take some action against this guy, but that action doesn't have to be like slay him where he stands. Um, yeah, I would like to think in human society we've come past the point where like the penalty for any kind of failure is instantaneous death. Um, <laughs> so. So yeah, so now in Secret V2, we have like generally kind of better thresholds here. Um, we, have, we have a new thing called memory.high, um, which instead of killing a process, we still have memory.max, which is very analogous to memory.limited bytes, which um killed your process. But we also have uh, memory.high. And what memory.high does is when you pass this threshold, we start to do throttling and reclaim when, for every single memory allocation. So when you go over memory.high and you want to do another malloc or you want to grab some more memory, um, then what we do is we break into a separate path in the kernel and we say, hey, 
I would like to uh, I would like to dial back this usage. So what I'm going to do is go to the tail of the inactive list and start reclaiming pages. So if you fail to reclaim any pages, it's still kind of good because you took a while to, to scan the page cache. It took you a while to scan the page cache. We've slowed down your application now. And we've done it in a way which is kind of transparent to your application. Um, but if you do manage to reclaim pages, then we also win because now you've retained some pages and you managed to get some memory free again. In fact, this is like a generally a much saner way of doing things. And this is like uh, using this on web servers was like a big win when you see like these spikes in resource usage. Uh, so notifications, I don't know like how notifications are like one of the more edge cases for, for C groups since it usually ends up being people who, like system D which end up using them. But uh, notifications are essentially a way to say, hey, something in my C group changed state. Um, it could be like, oh, I have no more processes in my C group, so all of them have, have finished. Um, it could be like, oh, one of my processes ran out of memory and I'm going to take some action based on that. Ultimately, it's a way to get information about what is happening in your C group. System D uses this, for example, to track uh, which processes are running and the state, of, uh, the state of your system and the state of the services which you're running. Um, the problem is on V1 for, for release notifications, which are the notifications which are sent when your C group has no more processes, which, for example, means like, oh, we exited. Um, you have to designate a, what's called a release agent. And this release agent you, is just like uh, giving a core dump uh, utility. You, you tell it, like, here's the path to my executable. And when you have no, no more processes, go and execute this, this, this thing with these arguments. The problem is now, if, you have, if you're using cgroups as a utility where, uh, say, you have cgroups expiring like 1,000 times a second, you're now like forking 1,000 times a second as well, which is pretty bad. Like, it's generally pretty expensive. And it doesn't make a whole lot of sense since the rest of the, the rest of uh, the C group API used slightly more sane methods using eventfd. Um, so now we have uh, I notify support everywhere. Uh, Sysfs C group looks like a file system. It kind of makes sense that it supports I notify. Um, we still have eventfd support, so you can like poll and find out what the answer is. Um, the idea now is you, you can have one process to monitor everything you like. You don't have to fork a new process every time an event is created. This is just like a, a straight upgrade, really. So utility controllers are another thing. Utility controllers are controllers, essentially. Most, most controllers in, in C group uh, are, are related to some particular resource. Say you have memory, CPU, IO. There are other ones, however, like, say, perf um, or freezer, which I'll also go into in a second, um, which are not related to some resource, but you put the processes in that C group based on some actions you want to take to them as a group. Um, so the idea is like basically you want to group them together so some user space utility can take some action based on that group. Um, Perf is a tool for performance monitoring and tracing in Linux. I guess uh, quite a few people have probably probably heard of it. And the way it works is when you say I want to have a certain set of C groups, is you give it a C group uh, C group path, and it says, okay, here is like some particular set of processes which I'm going to map into my own C group hierarchy. So now you have sysfs C group perf. Um, and inside there is a completely separate C group hierarchy, which only relates to perf. This usually doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Usually what people want to do is monitor an existing C group hierarchy, not create a new one. Um, so people ended up resorting to like tons of hacks like, oh, I want to like, copy over this hierarchy to the other one. They would write like, a tool to copy it from one, one hierarchy to another. And like, you end up with all these race conditions and like, horrible, and it was like, really, really bad. Um, so now having a unified hierarchy means we don't have to sync. You only have one hierarchy. So there's no way this could possibly go wrong, touch wood. So in V1, there's also like a lot of inconsistency between controllers. This usually comes in, in kind of two forms. Uh, one, you have inconsistent APIs between controllers which do exactly the same thing. So you have like the CPU, uh, both CPU and IO are essentially weight-based or share-based. You give a certain amount of some resource based on a relative amount to some, some other particular C group. Um, but the APIs were completely different. The API, you had to learn two APIs to do one thing, which is really, really not ideal. Um, so there's been a lot of focus on trying to unify the APIs um, and also unify the naming. Like Generally, like it was a bit of a crapshoot in V1, and now we have the opportunity to, to rethink those names and, and generally standardize them a bit more. So V2 is generally more intuitive up front. Oh, another one is, is kind of inconsistent C group semantics. Um, for example, root C groups, for example, 
uh, sorry, most C groups uh, inherit their parents' limits. So when you create a when you create a child C group of some particular C group, uh, it usually it usually can only use up to its parents' limits. Um, but some some controllers didn't do that. Some controllers did their own thing. For some controllers, this whole idea of a hierarchy was like an imaginary thing, and it just created a new C group and didn't care where it was. It was all a bit of a crapshoot. Um, so now with one unified hierarchy, it's 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 more difficult to fuck it up, I guess. So V1's, uh, V1's overflexibility also contributed to like a whole bunch of API problems. Um, for example, when memory limits were first uh, created, um, they only limited a few, uh, like a couple types of memory, um, and they were they were in this file memory dot limited bytes. Then, as more and more memory types were added, they ended up getting like their own files one by one. So you ended up with memory dot limited bytes, memory dot kmem dot limited bytes, memory dot kmem dot tcp dot limited bytes, memory dot msw dot limited bytes. And the really bad thing about this is now, yes, I have very granular control, but it's not very useful. Uh, because now, say I want to set a limit on the maximum number of tcp buffers, which is set with uh, memory dot uh, kmem dot tcp dot limited bytes. Now, say I have like 10 gigabytes of page cache free, and I set a limit on the number of tcp buffers. If I said like, oh, you should only get, uh, say, X amount of TCP buffers. If you go one over, we um kill you. Even if you had 10 gigabytes of page cache free or something like that, it's not a reasonable way of operating. Usually, like most people don't want, like most people don't care. Like you allocated one TCP buffer too many. They want to give some kind of idea about the overall memory use and like reasonable memory use. Generally, unified limits are the uh, only reasonable way to approach that. Um, so yeah, again, another trade-off kind of in favor of in favor of usability over over ultimate flexibility. <laughs> Uh, generally, if you do want to limit these things, say you wanted to limit some particular kind of resource, like the PID controller is a very good example. The PID, uh, in the early days of C groups, it was considered maybe we could limit the number of PIDs by like limiting certain types of kernel memory, but that turns out to be really, really fucking hard. Um, like, so another, the way that was fixed was we now have a PID controller, and that specifically controls this resource. So if you do want to do very specific kinds of limiting, like some TCP buffer or something else, then you should do that through a new controller. That's, that's the reasonable way to do that. So uh, if you go to facebook.com right now, uh, there is a 1 in 10 chance you are going to hit a server with secret v2. Um, we are running a secret v2 pool in like the tens of thousands of machines now. Um, and we're, in, we're investing heavily in Cgroup v2 for like a number of reasons. Um, my main concern, like I mentioned at the beginning, is limiting the failure domains between services. I really care a lot about making sure um, that we don't have cascading failures or anything like that on a machine. Um, and also being able to kind of manage the resource allocation in your data center, especially at Facebook scale, is, is really important. Like if we can suck just that little bit more uh, uh, resource efficiency at, at, at the data center, then that's, that's a really big win. Um, we run Cgroup v2 managed with systemd. Um, one of my teammates, David Capico, was sitting back there, uh, did a talk about this uh, at systemd.com for last year. Um, called, uh, I believe it was called, Deploying System D at Scale. Correct me if I'm wrong. Yes, it was. Um, so yes, we're, we're a really big contributor to, to the core of Seagrip v2. We have two of the core maintainers working at Facebook. Um, and we will continue to drive innovation here. Like This is a big, a big thing we're working on right now. So um, I already mentioned that Seagrip v2 is kind of new. Um, Seagrip v2 has been usable for a little while now, and the core is all very stable. Um, but that doesn't mean that there isn't still work to be done here. Like a lot of this is kind of building the building blocks for, for future work. Um, so the core APIs are stable, but there's definitely functionality to be worked on. When thinking about Seagrip's, like most people think of kind of Three things, I guess, which is I/O, memory, CPU. Those are like pretty much the biggest ones. And two out of three of those are, are merged currently. Um, PID, the PID controller is also merged. For the CPU controller, like it's very important, but there have been some disagreements with the CPU subsystem team about how to merge it. They have some disagreements about uh, the no internal process constraint and also like uh, having process granularity instead of uh, instead of thread granularity and stuff like this. Um, yeah, there's a very juicy drama-filled thread uh, at that link. Uh, as as all Linux kernel mailing list threads are, uh, it's, it's probably still better than usual. Um, we also may end up with some thread-based API for some particular kinds of thread operations that make sense. Um, that would be like in, in the works. <laughs> Uh, another kind of big bet that we're doing uh, right now is w one thing that, that Linux has never really had is a good metric for memory pressure. Um, like we have many kind of related metrics, like the amount of memory you have free or the, the amount of memory used. You can also look at stuff like uh, 
certain kinds of page scans or like, yeah, it's, it, but it's all very heuristic. And ultimately, none of these metrics prove that you actually are encountering memory pressure because they can also happen in a bunch of normal scenarios. Um, so our proposed measure is to track page refaulting. Um, so we, the essential way this will work is um, we track pages which are re consistently refaulted back into the inactive queue. Um, and uh, essentially, the way to explain how this whole thing works. So you have the inactive set. Those are pages which the kernel considers um, are probably not being actively used by any process. Then you have the active set, which it considers are more likely to be used by some, some process. And it's essentially one big list. And the way it works is when you have a page fault, you go to the head of the inactive list. Um, if, you got, if that page was accessed again, then it gets moved to the head of the active list, which means it's protected from, from reclaim. Um, and when we do a reclaim, um, we go from the tail of the inactive list. So we, we take the pages which we consider are the least likely to be used um, up for reclaim. So what happens if we keep on faulting pages in, and they get so far to the end that we keep on reclaiming them, and then they fault back in again immediately? That probably means that we have too many pages like at once for our system to handle. It probably means that we can't, we end up pushing them so fast off the edge that we simply don't have the resources to, to be able to deal with this number of pages. That is probably not a bad metric for, for, uh, for memory pressure, and it's one which is currently being worked on as part of the Secret V2 effort as well, because we do want to have those metrics around memory pressure, not just memory usage, which is kind of only tangential to the thing which you really want to know. So, oh, sorry, question? I thought I had a question. All right. Uh, so we, we also have uh, tracking now of uh, page capture writebacks. What this first point means is we have the tracking of memory and I.O., but we don't have tracking for CPU yet. Um, like, you spend some time on CPU waiting for network packets to come in on the network. We, and we don't know who it's for yet because it didn't get rooted yet, um, and we can't account for that yet. And we also can't account for the CPU we spent like, doing, a, doing a page cache write back yet. That's something which is going to take quite a bit of effort, um, but it's something which we're definitely working on at this point. Um, yeah, and as for the second point, uh, I already mentioned like the, the refaulting. Generally, the, the idea here is that we want better metrics for, for memory pressure, because right now we only have something tangential. Um, you, those of you who used V1 are probably also know about Freezer. Freezer is like an alternative to um killing, for example. Like you can freeze some set of processes in their state and then uh, go and decide, like, oh, I want to raise the memory limit, or I want to kill them, or I want to start, start some new processes. Um, it was essentially a way of freezing them in time and, and having some other process come and decide what to do about it. Um, in, in Secret V1, this didn't work at all, basically. Um, like if you, if you used Freezer, one of the most common things you might want to do is go and like get a stack trace and work out where, what they were doing when like they kept on allocating memory or whatever it was that you froze them for. But like it, it's a very common situation that you would end up with like say GDB if you would try to attach GDB, it would end up in D state, which is not really the ideal result if you want to like find out the stack uh, of some process which froze. Like that's generally the complete opposite of what what I would like. Um, the reason is like the freezer implementation in V1 doesn't guarantee that we stop anywhere reasonable. We we often stop in a stack which makes absolutely no sense in the kernel. Um, so in V2, the idea is to have like a more kind of sig stop style mechanism. Sig stop is very well defined, um, and where it stops is very well defined as well. Um, so it's a, it's kind of a more reasonable solution to use for stopping processes. So the the, the V2 implementation of freezer will be more along those kind of semantics. So uh, I talked a lot here about trying to sell you Secret V2, but I should actually tell you how to get it probably at some point during this talk. Um, so hopefully you're interested in trying it out yourself. Um, so here's what you need to get started with version 2. First, you need a kernel above 4.5. Um, before that, we do have a developer flag, um, which you can go find. Uh, I won't tell you because it, it'll like eat you if you try and use it and you don't know what you're doing. Um, but I, I really wouldn't recommend using it before 4.5. 4.5 is the first point we have a stable API. Um, once that's done, more or less two things to do. You need to turn off all of the controllers for V1, and you need to turn on uh, and mount the, the, the file system for V2. Um, typically, you want your init system to do this, for systemd, you use it with this flag. You basically put both of these on the kernel command line. Um, but if you're crazy or you want to try it yourself, you can also manually mount it and cry when things break. <laughs> um, so yeah, so if you're interested in hearing more about cgroups, come talk to me. Um, I'm happy to go over any of what I've been talking about uh, on v1 or v2. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll be happy to go over any questions you might have. Uh, and if you've used v1 in the past, which I guess many of you have, uh, and you found it lacking in some areas, please do try out v2 and let us know what you think. Thanks.